Hello and welcome to Diverse and Inclusive Leaders, the show where I interview the most inspirational and thought-provoking leaders of today and unearth their unique stories of diversity and inclusion to help inspire, educate and motivate others to make the world a better place. Today I am joined by the glorious Pauline Miller. Pauline is the head of culture at Lloyd's. She's a senior leader who's very, very passionate about creating a culture that really drives forward that innovation and enables colleagues to flourish and develop and reach their full potential. She's responsible for leading a team of professionals to deliver talent, leadership development, culture, diversity and inclusion, engagement at Lloyd's amongst many many other things. And we're going to be talking today all about reassessing yourself, your career, and really looking at how to harness the power of all the eclectic individuals within the organization to drive forward best performance in a culture that really works and really thrives. Welcome to the show, Pauline. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here and what a great intro. <laughs> <laughs> well you deserve it you deserve it and I think actually um you know what is a great thing to kind of kick off with today for all of those who perhaps don't know you as well as I do is how did you come to be where you are today both personally and also professionally because I know that you spin lots of different plates and do many different things so enlighten us into the journey that is that of of Pauline Sure. So, um, so I love the fact that I spin lots of plates. It's probably, you know, many people talk about ending up or landing in uh, a particular field or area of work. And I have to say that I just, I think I disappoint and surprise people when I say that I wanted to work in HR from the very early days. So from the age of 14, I had picked HR as the function of choice, the area that I was passionate about I, I had spent my work experience at the London Stock Exchange at 14 and um, I'm not sure what I really learned other than how to fold envelopes and how postcodes were made up I really enjoyed my time there I think the people the opportunity and one of the things that sparked my interest was how you know you could whittle down from 900 graduates some of whom had pictures on their CVs some didn't and how you whittled that down to a very very small cohort of graduates that would eventually get the opportunity to work for the London Stock Exchange. So for me, I guess that piqued my interest of DNI without me realising, but HR was definitely a firm position for me. So I took that interest and desire and I was, you know, really into sort of, you know, future head girl material, great. Unfortunately, I didn't get voted as head girl, probably because I got pregnant at school. That probably doesn't help your prospects, just want to point that out. I left school and uh, continued on with studies. And again, you know, I left school really disappointed. It's interesting now when I think about where we are today in 2020, but when I left school, I was really interested in history and realised that there was a real lack of black history in our curriculum. And I left school and went off to college at the age of 16 and studied black history because it was a real missing element for me. So I guess, you know, it brings me right back to where I am today. And then, of course, I went to university, had another child, majored in HR, in personnel, as it was then. So that's given an indication to my age. And then I landed a graduate job. I wasn't really going to go to work. But when I finished, I thought, oh, I really liked that advert, one advert. And I didn't end up in HR. I ended up in an IT company. Uh, and I spent about six years teaching people how to use Microsoft products, how to strip PCs down, how to write code. So I was actually a, a Microsoft certified professional for a while before I saw the light. <laughs> and then I remembered my childhood dream of HR and I transitioned over into, into a development team, train, training and development as it was then. And I, I worked there um, over in an investment bank until I moved into the d &I space. So I've spent uh, the last probably 15 years or so in diversity and inclusion. The last few roles have included leadership. Uh, and most recently, as we've really stood up the work around culture at Lloyd's, uh, Lloyds of London, that I've really moved into what is a new role um, of head of culture, really helping to drive both the corporation of Lloyd's, and that's who I'm employed by, but also the Lloyd's market 
on a cultural transformation journey. Wow, what a journey. And it's almost like you've gone full circle from visualizing as a 14 year old, which is incredible. Cause I think at 14, I had literally, other than actually wanting to be a vet and then wanting to be a pilot, had no idea really what I wanted to do, but you've literally gone all the way around the life cycle continuum and come straight back to where you visualized that you actually wanted, wanted to be. Absolutely. And, you know, there, you know, I've, I've been able to look back in my career and I've had some great opportunities to do so and recognize that there were different points of my journey where it really helped to get me to where I am. And some of the future opportunities were really down to decisions that I took in the early days. So when I first graduated, I, you know, I joined as an IT trainer, I had no idea what they did. And I got stuck in a room for three months learning Microsoft products. And I do mean Outlook, PowerPoint, Word, Excel, you know, they come out of the womb almost learning how to use those products now. So it really was something back then. And I remember going into the Houses of Parliament and teaching MPs and the peers and Blackrod how to use Microsoft Outlook. And six months later, I was still at the Houses of Parliament getting really, really bored. And I said, yeah, I want to do something else. And they said, well, if you want to learn this product, we'll happily take you off the off of Houses of Parliament and you can go to CSO De Beers. So I stuck my hand up. And that was a continuing theme. Every time they wanted somebody to learn a new product or a new course to be delivered, I stuck my hand up. So I never expected that I'd be stripping PCs down and teaching help desk analysts how to be, uh, you know, how to respond. Yes, I taught them how to press, press control or delete. And let's see what happens. <laughs> that was our mantra. So those are the sorts of things I did, but I just stuck my hand up every single time and you know a couple of firms later if you think about those early decisions I had technical skills I had soft skills I had a HR background and a solid base in terms of training and development because of course that was my major at uni and I had managed people and 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 uh, trained them to be trainers themselves so when my role at an investment bank came along, they needed somebody that was both able to work in the HR training and development team and help them to transition over to a new learning management system. So they needed technical as well as HR training and development skill. And so those early decisions to stick my hand up went a really long way in moving me into both the HR department, which was obviously my ambition, but also into the sort of financial services sector where I am still today. It's amazing how, to a degree, serendipity and to a degree that being bold and brave enough to stick your hand up and say, hey, I want to do that, not necessarily knowing what the outcome is, but then later on down the line, all of those different facets and those pieces of the jigsaw suddenly come together. And it's like that aha moment where it's like, oh, maybe that's why I was meant to have done all of those different things. And I know that you are a big fan of self-reflection and obviously looking at oneself and Mm -hmm. assessing assessing when it comes to kind of you know your own personal development and often you know that's the most difficult thing to do it's very easy as you know be it DNI, HR professionals to give great advice to others but then to internalize and look at oneself and say hey you know where am I at where do I want to get to and how do I then get there is that something you've done on a frequent basis and would you say it's something that's allowed you to to get to the you know the heights that you are at right now because you have been so good at that self-reflection piece Oh, absolutely. So I think, you know, my, my mantra is to review my career every two years, every two to three years. And I regularly sit back and I I ask myself a couple of questions. So number one, am I really happy in the work that I'm doing? Is there enough stretch in the work that I'm doing? Do I think it's adding to me in the next three to four to five years? So is what I'm doing currently going to give me the stretch and the development growth to where I might want to be in the future? There's no definite of what that looks like, but I absolutely want to make sure that I'm continuing to develop new skills and that I am continuing to grow. You know, complacency is not a great place to be. And I think the world of diversity and inclusion, especially, really continues to evolve. Just take the last 18 months or so from in, in my world, it's really evolved and it's continued to develop and grow in terms of the areas that we need to really go after. 
Um, so that's something that I do on a regular basis. And, and I do remember telling one former boss, don't worry, I've done my two year review a little early and I've decided to stay. <laughs> <laughs> I love how forthright that is. That's just very classically you. <laughs> <laughs> what did they say what did they say at that moment were they taken aback were they kind of like well, yeah good on you for uh having done that poorly yeah she sort of said oh well thank goodness for that and I said but let me tell you where I see my next step and that was really clear and I've got more and more confident with that as the years have gone on but it wasn't you know later on in life you know I remember in in the in the first uh, bank that I worked for I remember sticking my hands up as you do going off to the US and working out there for a number of weeks to support a team and had a really clear view about what I wanted to do next. And when I got back, they weren't willing to put me in that position. They didn't want to move me out of the work I was doing. You're great where we are, where you are, but we don't necessarily want to move you across at this time. And I just sat around and I talked to some really good friends and I have a good friend who was uh, you know, a couple of friends in the team and they said, look, there's a DNI role over there. You'd be great at it. And if you don't apply, we're going to kick you ourselves. You know, I, I, I transitioned across into the wealth management part of the business and into a DNI role. And again, you know, yes, I'd stuck my hands up and I'd gone out to the US and I'd really engaged with some of the diversity networks out there. And that's what spiked the passion for me to want to then move into DNI full time. So I'm, I'm really keen for that. But if I thought, and that was only, you know, sort of what, six years into my career. If I fast forward just a couple of years ago, so now I'm already working at Lloyd's, I'm already uh, leading a team, I've expanded my responsibilities to include leadership and learning from just the, not just the DNI agenda. And actually a couple of years ago, my son moved, uh, he went off to follow his dreams. And I remember sitting back and thinking to myself, what were my dreams? What did I want to do? Because my children have been with me my entire career. I had my son before uni, as I said, at school, I had my daughter in my second year of uni. So when I graduated, I had two kids in tow. And of course, you're building a career with the two children. And I was a single mum. So it's a real, you know, a, a real sort of, what did I want to do? And then what I did was I drew, um, I call it my four quadrants. You know, the first one was around career and sort of professional development. The second was around my own personal relationships and what I wanted from those. The third was around what I personally wanted for me, especially from a health and a well-being perspective. And the fourth was undecided. It was the future. And my view was is that the first three would all lead me to that fourth box. And what that meant was is I then went off and I decided to study a master's because I just wasn't busy at work, clearly. <laughs> so I thought, I know I'll go and do a, a master's because somewhere in, you know, inside, I really felt that I'd always wanted to do a postgrad degree. I'd just taken on a new area, going back to my development roots. And I just wanted to sort of solidify some of that learning. And, and I found a great, great course over at Kingston, on Occupational Business Psychology. And I've done that. I've just finished that over the last two years. What was really exciting was how much of it, A, I already knew in the early stages, how much extra I learned and how much of it would become so, so tied to the work that I do now. You know, in some ways, I, I don't think that when I started back in 2018, I thought that I would end up in a head of culture role, just going in as a, you know, as a, as, yes, a senior professional, but I didn't realise how many, of, how much of the content, the lectures, the dialogue and the discussion would really feed into the work that I do today. So I think that's been a really, you know, a really powerful, again, continuing to evolve and to reflect and to take a small nugget from everything that you do because there's always a positive element and even if you're doing a role for a year and it doesn't quite give you what you're looking for you can always find those positive elements that you can utilize in the future and this is so you in a nutshell you're such a glass half full girl and I find it inspiring every time I speak with you is this you know this 
constant thirst for more and more knowledge mm -hmm. and the way that you describe it is very much how I would describe I suppose the, the journey of diversity inclusion belonging and culture is this constant evolutionary journey where there's always new pieces being added on and there's always formative knowledge that can be translated into the current environment and you know I guess on this subject because I'd love to get into kind of some of the intersectionality pieces which you've also yeah. mentioned earlier is what diversity, inclusion, belonging means to you right at this point in time? Because obviously you've seen the diversity inclusion journey, you know, mm. a, a, along for, for a number of years now, pre coming into this culture role. I think it's a really interesting one because I think it's it's the very fact that DNI and belonging, it means so many different things to different people. And it's how do we take the sum of all those parts and make them whole? So, and how do we, how, you know, so I look at my journey and think, hey, you know, which part of the journey would you really like me to, to dialogue with? And so, yes, I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm a mother, I've, I, you know, I, was, I raised my children as a single mother. All of those things make up me. That's, that's just one, that's just the first ones that come off the top of my, top of my head. And how do I take all of those parts and make me whole? And what's really interesting is that I, about five years ago, I really, I've sit oh, a bit longer actually, back in 2013, I was given an opportunity to become a advisory board member of a UN foundation movement called Girl Up. And I forever look back at my journey into Girl Up. It was just because, you know, somebody phoned me up and said, I need you to meet these people. I was like, sure, okay, I'll meet them. I haven't got time, but I'll meet them. We had a really great time and it led to me becoming an advisory board member. And my first meeting in the first four months, I went out to Ethiopia. Girl Up is all about engaging girls to be vocal champions and advocate and, uh, you know, raising awareness and advocacy for global gender equality. And we take girls, you know, sort of 12, 13, and they become these future leaders that are so inspirational. You just, you're just in awe of how passionate and bold they are and how much they want to strive for equality across the globe. I was out in, in, in Ethiopia and I'm in Addis Ababa airport and I'm sitting there and I got this amazing, just this huge attack of, of like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Like, what on earth have I done to, uh, you know, to even feel that it was my place to be in Addis Ababa representing this UN foundation and there were like movie stars come in and like teenage girls who had been campaigning for years and there was me somebody working in a financial service organization out in London hadn't really done anything massive um, what did I bring to the table and this attack of self-doubt and conscious you know, sort of, I, I don't deserve to be here. Stayed with me for a couple of, a good couple of days. And, you know, you were going around, you were meeting different people from UNHCR and, you know, they were so grateful for you to be there. And I'm going, I don't really deserve this. And then I went to Jijiga. It's one of the refugee camps that was, uh, that's in Ethiopia and, you know, tens of thousands of refugees, some who have been there you know, at the time, as long as, as, as old as my son and older, 20 plus years in a refugee camp with no hope of getting out, you know, no, it's not a, I can go back to my home country, I'm going to get resettled, the number of those being resettled was so low, but talking to the girls and talking to their parents, talking to their mum, was when I, and sit, this is sitting on the floor in a refugee's home, in a refugee camp, was when I realised that I had the ability to give a voice and to be a voice for others who were like me, that we shared a common interest, a common goal, that we had had and travelled the same journey, and that I could give that shining light to some of, her, some of those girls. And I remember saying to the mum, I am like you. I had my child at 15, as did you. And I really understand how important it is for your girls to educate and to grow and, and the hope and the faith and, the, and all of the, the you know, the, the hope that you have and you put in your children. I really understand that. You know, at your age, I had a child and you have the opportunity for education. 
don't waste it. Don't don't lose that. Nobody can take that away from you. And it was because of education and because of family support that I've been able to continue to grow. And, you know, my voice got stronger and my purpose for myself became more real. And I really understood this ability that you didn't have to tick a certain box to be this role model. You didn't have to, you know, have been in a movie or have um, been campaigning forever, but you had the ability, each and every one of us has the ability to provide inspiration. So for me, what makes me whole is bringing all of those individual parts and now being able to talk about it as me. Wow, Pauline, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for sharing. And that is just such, I mean, it's such a touching story of of real humility as well. And I think what it demonstrates is, you know, when you strip back all of the layers and, and absolutely kind of everything on the front face of it, you know, celebrity titles, whatever it might be, we are just people at the end of the day. We are people and it is that human connection that you had with these girls that really empowered them. And, you know, clearly that's translated into all of the other work that you're doing. And, you know, I hope, you know, we have more and more leaders like you who are really willing to, in a non-condescending way, send the lift back down. Because if we're not doing it for those future generations of leaders to leave this world in a better place for both business and wider society, to impart further knowledge, empowerment, education, then what are we doing it for? Absolutely. You know, it, it's, it's that sort of, you know, the, the, the sense of when, if you can find purpose in your own life, one that you can truly sit back and say do you know if I achieve nothing else I know that I gave this that purpose that sense it gives you real serenity when times are tough it gives you a real sense of belonging when you feel alone Um, there is so much there I feel so connected to the girl up community I feel so connected to the work of being able to support and campaign for them. There are so many different ways that it connects me, but I also recognize how much it's given me a voice. So there are, you know, if you can find that sense of purpose and my purpose is to be able to speak up for those who can't speak up. My purpose is to be able to create a better life for others and to be able to use all of the, all of my lessons along the way and to share when they've gone wrong, because trust me, made a few slip ups along the way. Absolutely. You know, probably having my daughter in the second year of uni was a hard one for my mum. <laughs> she thought I was going to quit. I think she took that one harder than the first. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, there are slip ups, you know, slip ups along the way. But my children are amazingly great. And you know what? My daughter and I argue all the time and I regularly say to others, you know, sometimes what you're doing is just good enough. It can be really hard. The pressures of life, society, the pressure of being a single mum and my daughter going off and going, oh, their dad makes breakfast for them every morning. I'm thinking, well, your dad's not here. You can ask him when you go, but I'm doing what I can. What I, you know, so being good enough, you are good enough. We are all good enough. Pauline, that is such a powerful message. And, you know, I am so sure that so many people have taken away a huge amount of learnings from this. And I am too. This is like the best career masterclass ever. And I think it's so, but it is, it's, it's true though. It's so important that we remember not only one, every voice matters and everyone can be a role model, as you have said, or a real model, as I like to call them, mm. because, you know, we don't need to be a, you know, an Angelina Jolie or a celeb out there. Mm. Actually, real models are far easier to relate to and can have a lot more of an impact a lot of the time. But also, we don't need to be perfect. And I think, you know, in today's modern society, I worry, um, even though I don't have children yet, about what you know, the future hopeful kids will think with the pressures of of social media and everything that's constantly on our devices, attached to our hips all the time about this kind of this perfect life and being the perfect human being and being the perfect leader and the perfect parent and the perfect everything. Actually, being okay is absolutely good enough. And so, you know, whilst we might want to strive for this self-actualization in Maslow's hierarchy or or whatever, (laughs) um, you know, actually, do any of us ever get there? And is it the worst thing if we don't well and 
do you know what? I, you know, I'm, I'm quite comfortable recognizing I couldn't, achieve, I couldn't have everything all at the same time. You know, I, like, can you have it all? Yes. All at the same time? Probably not. Um, there are just different things that get in the way. And sometimes it's okay to work on a lattice, not necessarily a ladder. And I, you know, when I think about where to go, I, I assess different opportunities, different needs. And sometimes it is, maybe it looks like a sideways movement, but there'll be something different that you can add into that bucket. And, you know, I, I was a governor for 10 years. I was chair of governors for nine and a half years clearly a quick succession to the top there you know the breadth of knowledge that running a governing body and yes they're volunteers but trust me it's really hard you've got parent governors teacher governors you know non-teaching staff governors you've got to be a critical friend to the to the head teacher and you're there to you know be strategic guidance not necessarily to manage the school no different to boards thinking mm. about how you act how you work on a board so I think there's there are real opportunities to broaden your abilities, your knowledge and your understanding. Trust me, there is no bigger amount of scrutiny than being in front of the Ofsted governors, uh, the <laughs> Ofsted inspectors, should I say, and realising that, you know, your name's going to be on that report as chair of governors. <laughs> <laughs> they can so, come and find you. Exactly. <laughs> but it is a superb example of this, this cross-sector experience, though. And I think, you know, again, hopefully this is someone that everyone takes away from listening to this podcast is having experience in other areas and certainly within those voluntary sectors as you say it can be more difficult I mean think of I can only imagine I'm not a parent yet but imagining the politics with lots of kids parents and Ofsted as you say you know in a in a boardroom you're not dealing perhaps with such strong emotions as offspring and the you know the parents of those offspring I mean the politics for that must be absolutely phenomenal because you're like a so if I think about growth from diversity and inclusion, you know, the, the purpose of, me, of growing that part of my world is that DNI is, is a fantastic space to be and you constantly see things evolve and you constantly switch light bulbs on for people, be it through heart or mind or otherwise. And what I really wanted to do when I started on my master's was that I really wanted to bring the science behind that and to really understand what more we needed to do to shift the dial and the reality is, is that driving cultural change, which is not about creating inclusive environments only, it's not about DNI as a whole, it's about what happens every day across the whole of the business when you think about organizational culture. It's one of those, you know, I, I, I love thinking of, you know, Shine's model where it talks about artifacts and the symbols. You know, what are the symbols um, that are in the organisation that just reminds people this is how things get done when no one's looking? It is that. And so if you can tap into the culture of an organisation, you can really help to drive forward that diversity and inclusion agenda. And I think that's the for me, the next journey, that much broader element of organisational culture and how we really drive our leaders, how we recognise the values and the behaviours that really have us thinking about, you know, and, and how do you seep d into that? Because if you can seep it in, and we all know that, the more you can embed it, the, the, the more longevity it will have and the more successful it will be. So, so that's a a directional change slightly that includes some of that diversity and inclusion lens but being much more broader in thinking about the organizational as a, the organization as a whole I'm so excited for your, your new role and you're going to have to come back and do another podcast on, <laughs> on culture um, because quite easily I know that we could talk about this all day and you know culture is I mean the, the word itself culture is very interesting because it's like a, it's like a living breathing sleeping thing that almost it's interwoven throughout the fabric of our everyday lives and our beings within organizations and sometimes arguably perhaps quite difficult to spot until you really drill down into these I like the symbology piece that you mentioned there because I've never actually thought about it from that point of view actually what do these certain things represent and if they've been there historically is that you know dictating that we almost or sublim subliminally rather translating into the way that we behave within the workplace and the things in which we do because of those inadvertent kind of you know 
Absolutely. So, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I love a great one, you know, in, in the Lloyds building, you know, um, this may change, you know, I doubt it will change quickly because of the time we find ourselves in. But certainly, you know, there are these real values in the organisation, some of which we absolutely love. You know, it's great being able to go into the lift first because I'm a woman, because the men will stop anybody else going in first. But also, is that one that we really need? It's, you know, but it's, it's this constant space. Um, I love the fact that in the underwriting room, you know, for some reason, all of the men absolutely seem to think they need to wear their jacket and tie. It's this sort of values, espoused value that they have that makes them feel that that is our, it's part of our culture. There's no dress code that says they must have their jacket on, but they'll leave their office and pull the tie up. So it's a real interesting element that says, how does that feed into our culture overall? And then, and then if you think about a suit and tie and a jacket, how does that then feed into other other groups from different cultural, uh, you know, inclusive and diverse backgrounds? Oh, this is so interesting because it is literally it's like the unwritten rules of the organisation. And I mean, straight away, if you if you and I were sitting here in, in, in suits and ties, you, know, you suddenly feel the need to kind of sit with a straighter, <laughs> straighter back and act more formal. But I mean, it's, you know, small things that are big things. I mean, imagine if. I don't know, all, all of the guys or guys and girls who would come in in suits and ties wore something different for a day. What would then happen? How would that translate into their body language? I mean, it is, you know, human well, can, psychology can, at its best. <laughs> I can tell you I'm leading the way. I think I try to walk through, but of times of when we were in the office, I think I'm probably the one walking through the underwriting room in the brightest colours that I can absolutely find every single day. So they all know I'm there. And <laughs> love it. Ta-da! I am here. I've arrived. <laughs> um, but it's um, you know, and it's it's absolutely great when you go in, and and I think we are starting to see that you know wonderful parts of change, and there are parts of our cultures that will be traditional when we reflect on our organisations, and some of those we absolutely want to be able to retain, and some of those values that we have, maybe it's a customer value. Maybe it's a, a community value and maybe you want to keep some of those parts of your values, but there will be other parts of your culture that might be slightly outdated, that may not be as appealing to others from diverse backgrounds and um, that may not create that inclusive culture. And so consider culture more broadly, uh, different aspects of culture and how it can support or hinder diversity and inclusion. Indeed. And as usual, I could talk to you forever in a day. And I'm looking at the clock thinking, oh my goodness, we've not even got to the lightning round yet. So on that note, before we do our, our, our learning summary for, uh, for, for the podcast, I, I must ask a couple of quick lightning round questions, which are very relevant to what we've been talking about. And first and foremost, I, I will start with the hardest one first. Is there and what is your secret to success? I would say the secret to success is listening to feedback feedback, reflecting and continuous learning. Any favourite quotes or books or podcasts other than this one obviously that you particularly enjoy or would be great learning material for people to be tuning into or picking up from their shelves? Oh wow I've got tons of books so a really tough one to go there. I'm just going to say that what goes around comes around. So it's really important that you give back. It's really important that you support others because I think that sums up a lot of the, 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 you know, I read constantly. So that's what I would say. What goes around comes around. Support everyone else around you. Brilliant quote. And finally, if you could go back in time, perhaps to being the 14-year-old you, or maybe even earlier, I'm not sure, is there any advice that you would give to your younger self or someone who could be listening in today, who's in a similar situation? So if I was going back to my 14-year-old self, I'd say, don't worry, everything will be okay, but you've got to work really hard for it. You've got to stay focused and you've got to use the support of those around you. Um, I didn't raise my children on my own. It took a whole community of friends and family and it is that community of friends and family that have supported me in my career. And it can be hard and it can be tough. And I know how hard it was to, you know, find pe pennies down the back of the sofa in the early days to feed my children. I get it and I understand it. And it is so tough. 
And if anything, I would say is that, you know, work hard, stay committed, stay focused and keep learning. And that really will allow you to look back and reflect on your career, both uh, if you're doing it for your children, for other family members, it allows you to be able to say, hey, you know, I have real comfort in what I've achieved and real pride in what I've been able to do. Wow. Pauline, there's been so many learning pieces from today. And I mean, I could just repeat the whole podcast and those are all great (laughs) learnings, but I picked out a couple here as I always do a summary at the end. And for me personally, I think actually this has been a superb career masterclass. I really particularly like the pieces around the four quadrants. And it reminds me of an island exercise that I sometimes teach people. You know, when you look at kind of self-reflection I know we've talked a lot about that and I think clearly that's helped you get to um, you know the great lofty heights that you're at right now but actually looking at um, you know these four quadrants piece you know when it comes to personal professional and family and looking ahead to the future I think I'm a big fan of visualization and so this was you know right in my wheelhouse as my husband would say Um, but I'd encourage anyone who's listening to have a bit of time of of kind of self-reflection and try and be forthright because I think as Pauline has done you know, putting your hand up, not necessarily knowing what those opportunities might be, but knowing that there is a guiding, overriding faith that if you do those things, eventually you will realize that they all fall nicely into place eventually. You know, and also that kind of that real hunger for knowledge and self-assessment of oneself. I think it's very easy sometimes to give other people advice, but looking at ourselves and making sure that we are looked after ourselves is is absolutely critical and so you know like Pauline maybe looking at your career every two or three years and not just the career but also how that fits into your your personal and your family life because it is a delicate balancing act that none of us will ever get perfectly but sometimes um, as you said Pauline being okay sometimes that is absolutely good enough because things aren't easy and don't be fooled that the leaders who are sitting in those senior positions have had it easy it's probably been a rocky road getting to that point So do remember that we are all human. And I'll finish this summary with this quote that I love, and I've never heard this before. So it's okay to to work on a lattice, not a ladder. That is just fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And knowing as well that as long as we're learning and we're developing ourselves, sometimes sideways moves are actually the best moves we can make because you realize later on down the line that we were meant to have done that. So Pauline, thank you so much. You've been an absolute superstar as ever. You're probably sick to the death of me because you're seeing me every week and I'm like, Pauline, Pauline. Um, (laughs) Not at all. Absolutely my pleasure. Really enjoyed it. (laughs) You have been a superstar. And for everyone listening, you've been tuning in today to the Diverse Inclusive Leaders podcast show brought to you by Dial Global. You've been listening to the superb Pauline Miller from Lloyd's. You can catch up with her if you've got any questions or you're affected by anything at all from today's episode. Do reach out and connect. She's on LinkedIn. You can find her there. You can also reach out to the team or I as well. If there's any anything that you want to talk about, please don't be a stranger. We're with you every week, twice a week. You can visit us at www.dialglobal.org forward slash podcast and we'll look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you so much for watching the Diverse and Inclusive Leaders podcast. Please do feel free to hit the like button below or if you'd like to receive future notifications, do ping the notification bell here at the side. If you're interested in the audio version only, you can find it on the following streaming platforms. Any extra info and descriptions will be in the links below. Look forward to seeing you soon.